Progress. I want to welcome everybody to this um, third edition of Corridor Conversations for 2022. Um, this is a program that we have run for the last uh, year and a half. Um, that is sponsored by Helping Hands University Park, Hyattsville Aging in Place, um, Neighbors Helping Neighbors College Park, and Explorations on Aging College Park, which are all the villages along Route 1. Our idea was to um, showcase, you know, the, fr the creative people, uh, the programs and things along Route 1, and we've been doing this um, for a while, have had poetry in the past, we'll have poetry today, we've also done cooking shows and many other things. Y you all know that March is Women's History Month, um, and so this is a good time to reflect on uh, the emergence of the women's liberation movement in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, Deborah Rosenfeld's a, a great choice for running this program. She's been involved in uh, women, the women's issues um, through her whole career, both personally um, and and in her scholarship. She's a professor emerita from the University of Maryland, Harriet Tubman Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. Previous to that, she was at San Francisco State University and at Cal State Long Beach. She's had a long academic career in this area. She directed also for 20 years the University of Maryland's Curriculum Transformation Program to include gender, race, class, and other uh, sexual identity and other um, protected class issues and groups uh, across the curriculum. She's written widely on 20th century women's literary and cultural history and has also written about women artists, filmmaking, and curricular change. I'm going to just turn this over to her. She's got a great presentation and is going to show us a whole lot of, uh, show us and talk to us about a whole lot of programs. Uh, excuse me, a whole lot of poems. Deborah, welcome and thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Hi, thanks. Um, and uh, I just want to begin by saying a huge thank you um, both to Loretta for inviting me to do this, um, to, uh, to Lisa for doing the introduction so gracefully, and especially above all to Carter, who has held my hand because in spite of that background that you just heard, none of it was in tech. <laughs> <laughs> so I am incredibly grateful for the technological help, but all problems are my own responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Wait, I should take me. The, the, the subtitle of this talk, uh, the talk is The Personal and the Political Poetry of the Women's Liberation Movement, but there's a subtitle, which is So Many Poems, So Little Time. Um, it was really hard to select the poems that I wanted to share today and, you know, to create this, um, some kind of story about them. And I found that most of the generalizations I wanted to make were, were not really true um, because there's such an incredible outpouring of women's poetry um, during the years that I'm going to be talking about. And that'll be mostly the poetry in um, from the 1970s through the 1990s, uh, with one early exception. Um, I'm not going to try to give a chronology um, of the poetry. I'm not going to try to um, give a chronology of the women's movement, certainly. Um, but I will say that something happened that some people actually call the women's poetry movement during those years, just an incredible outpouring flowering of women's poetry with what we might consider a kind of modern feminist consciousness. And um, it was a place where um, there was a community around it, and there was theorizing about women's issues done in it. And I think most of all, um, there was inspiration from it. So I've picked poems that, that I love, um, but also by poets who've been very prolific, very influential, um, poets who've written many volumes of poetry and often really important essays, um, literary criticism, but also political essays and ethical essays about, about pressing ethical issues. Um, 
the fact that they had this kind of shared sense of community, I think, is um, really exemplified. There's this moment in 1974 when Adrian Rich, maybe the most famous, well-known poet from these years, from the women's movement, gets a National Book Award for um, uh, her book of poems, Diving into the Wreck. And instead of accepting it on her own, she and Alice Walker and Audre Lorde, three other, two other really well-known poets, accept it jointly in a joint speech in the name of all of the women whom they see as having been silenced by a male-dominated literary culture. And just to remind us, I mean, there are enough people here my age who, pro who remember this, <laughs> but just to remind us, um, when, Lisa, yeah? Oh, yeah, okay, age, yes, okay. Um, when, when I first started teaching, and even when I was in graduate school, I, I actually got my dissertation on the British romantic poets, Keats and Shelley and those guys. But by the time I started teaching, I, I had not read very many poems by women poets. I mean, the romantic poets were ostensibly all male. And... Um, we read very, you know, we read a few novels by women the whole time I was in graduate school and, and a handful of, of poems by people like um, Emily Dickinson, maybe. So um, when I talk about male dominated literary culture, that's what I mean is, you know, an almost complete absence of, of women's voices, even though we know now that they were writing, that women were writing. Um, so I'm not going to give you all the details about um, the biographical details about individual poems, but I think Carter is going to be posting in chat um, a uh, bibliography, a very short bibliography of resources. I, I really recommend the poetryfoundation.org where you can find out um, a lot more bibliographical information. Um, so uh, today um, we're going to be looking at a, a range of poems. I've tried to include as many as possible um, because I love them and it's so hard to decide what to leave out. Uh, but that, what that has meant is that we're not going to spend as much time analyzing the language of individual poems um, than, I, than I usually do. And we'll be talking more about the thoughts and the feelings, the ideas, the visions of the poets um, at the time. But for a few ones, for a couple of the poems, we'll be pausing for a more kind of in-depth discussion. So, there are so many themes and issues that women's poetry in those years addressed. I mean, really, they wrote about everything. Um, but the ones that really addressed women's issues, I mean, here's a kind of overview. This is deliberately not an outline because these are overlapping themes. Um, they cover the whole range of experience, really. Uh, and what I want to just say generally is that the poetry in those years, there were these readings that we would come to. I, I'm sure some of you had the same experience where our poets would read um, the people who were, who were moving to us. And we would sit in women's bookstores or the small presses, the, the women's presses that were growing at the time would be circulating manuscripts of the latest poems by Judy Gron or um, uh, Paula, Paula Gunn Allen, an American Indian writer and people like that. And people were, they were writing about all of these um, kinds of topics. I, how do you insert history and how do you insert women into history and remake myths to include women? Um, what does it feel like to love another woman? Because uh, lesbian voices were very important in, in women's poetry. Um, the experiences of violence, of, of rape, of incest, not always positive things. A lot of these poems are painful. Um, but also these utopian longings, the sense of a better world, um, the experiences of women, um, of women's bodies. We'll be talking more about that today. Um, poems about war and peace. 
um, poems about the quest for identity, um, poems about the historical traumas of particular groups, slavery, the Middle Passage, the Holocaust, and collective memory, um, poems about resistance uh, to racism, to sexism, to capitalism and exploitation, um, poems about nature and women's experiences in the natural world, and poems about family relationships. So the poems that we're going to look at, the themes that we're going to look at today, um, I've decided to focus on three. The, the processes of coming to voice, of learning to speak, of refusing to be silenced. Um, women writing the body uh, in celebration, of, in pain, acknowledging what has been taboo, what has been silenced, what has been unsaid, and exploring and forging identities and reaching across differences. Um, and I'm, I'm going to, um, just in advance of the talk, because we're not going to be able to focus a lot on specific uh, poetic strategies, some of the strategies that, that you can look for in the slides uh, have to do with the expressions of I, the subjected voice of you, um, an audience, a sort of an assumed shared audience of we, um, and the allowance of the personal, in, as we'll see, um, into, the, into the poem. Um, Adrian Rich's dream of a common language Right, the idea that poetry should not just be for an elite, it should be accessible to people at large, even though Rich herself writes and continues to write in a more academic mode than most poets. But there's a breaking down of, this, of, this, of the, of the um, distinction of the border between the academy and, and the individual. Um, there's also, uh, in a lot of these poems, a kind of irony, a, an ironic uh, tone of anger and humor. And we'll see a couple of uh, some of those poems, um, sometimes ironic, sometimes humorous. There's a lot of wit in these poems. Don't let anybody tell you that feminists had no sense of humor, because um, we did. And um, various other strategies, including, you know, um, a lot of writing in free verse in a way that tries to echo the, the language of common speech, and um, a dis dispensing sometimes with punctuation entirely, or using it quite irregularly. So keep your eye out for those, even though we may not get to discuss them in individual poets. So um, I'm going to start with uh, a poem that actually comes a little before our time period um, by Muriel Rukeyser. Uh, the poem I'm going to use is from 1968, so it almost makes the 1970s. She was, in a way, a kind of mother of at least part of the women's movement. And um, she, this, this quote, what would happen if one woman told the truth about her life, the world would split open. Um, it's a good introduction to her insistence that it is okay for poets to use their personal voice. And when we do the poem from her, which I'll let you, I'll let you hear in her voice, um, just remember that at the time that, that, um, that she's writing this poem, there's a kind of rule about not equating the speaker of the poem with the poet herself. You say speaker, you don't say the poet says, you say the speaker says. Um, and Rich in this poem tries to break that down and to say, it's all right to say I. I've been writing using masks. I've presented myself as Orpheus or Eurydice. She writes a lot about Orpheus and Eurydice, as you'll hear in this poem. Um, it's the, but but I, now let's do away with masks and write in our own voices. poem as mask. When I wrote of the women and their dances and wildness, it was a mask on their mountain, god hunting, singing, in orgy, it was a mask. When I wrote of the god fragmented, exiled from himself, his life, 
the love gone down with song, it was myself split open, unable to speak in exile from myself. There is no mountain, there is no God, there is memory of my torn life, myself split open in sleep, the rescued child beside me among the doctors, and a word of rescue from the great eyes. No more masks, no more mythologies. Now, for the first time, the God lifts his hand, the fragments join in me with their own music. Um, I forgot to mention that in the closed captions, they sometimes make mistakes. That is not the dog lifting its paw. <laughs> that is the God lifting his hand. So um, sorry about that. So those of you who downloaded the poems, for, uh, or if you're able to download the poems, it's really easier to if you can if you can look at the poems on your handout. I was afraid that not many people would actually do that, and so uh, Carter and I worked to try to find other ways of giving you access to them, and we'll be putting some in in chat. But if you've got that handout and can open it at the same time as you see the slides, it's a great way to go. Um, so, uh, but. Um, hopefully the closed captions for at least some of the poems where I have the readings that by the poems themselves, that'll help out. So in that poem, you, as you, I'm sure you heard, um, what she does is talk about my own life, memory of my torn life, split open in sleep, the rescued child beside me. And she, it's a reference to a very difficult birth she had, a cesarean operation um, that was really hard. And I, a word of rescue from the great eyes, I have never seen a satisfactory explanation for the great eyes, so we're not going to worry about them. But no more masks, no more mythologies. Um, now, for the first time, the fragments, the sense of a fragmented self, um, but the fragments join in me with their own music. Um, and uh, the best anthology of poetry from that period, which was edited by my teacher and mentor, Florence Howe, who was the founder of the Feminist Press. It's called No More Masks, and it's really, really good. It's a great collection. So the next poem that we're going to hear um, is from Audre Lorde, and let me remind you that you can be putting questions or comments into chat, and I'll pause after the Lord poem and see if um, uh, Marianne has any, any, anything to, um, that she wants to uh, single out from chat that we could talk about briefly. So this is Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde, I'm, I'm sure most of you, or many of you at least, have, have heard of her. Really one of the most important poems of the women's movement, and also an essayist and theorist of note. And I used her quote in the blurb for this talk, poetry is not a luxury. It's a vital necessity of our existence. I'm not sure what happened, why, why the, why the um, bottom line disappeared. But what she insists is that poetry is the is this, it's this lens that people see and feel through. And here she is reading a poem called A Litany for Survival. And again, it has to do with coming to speech, with finding one's own voice. Um, and while she's reading it, I want you to think about who the who the we is in this poem i mean who who was she writing this poem for uh, and if you have thoughts about that please do put them into chat um can everybody see this is it is the is the it looks like the, the slide got here. Uh, it looks like it, uh, well, 
All right. Can everyone see it? Is, is it all on the slide? Okay, great. Yes. Okay. I cannot get to the bottom line. So I can't bring up the, um, hold on. I should be. Uh, Deborah, I think you just need to press the, uh, the start button on it in the middle of the, the video frame. Okay. <laughs> that would help. Thanks, Carter. <laughs> For those of us who live at the shoreline, standing upon the constant edges of decision, crucial and alone, for those of us who cannot indulge the passing dreams of choice, who love in doorways coming and going in the hours between dawn, looking inward and outward at once before and after, Seeking a now that can breed futures like bread in our children's mouths so their dreams will not reflect the deaths of ours. For those of us who were imprinted with fear like a faint line in the center of our foreheads, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk, for by this weapon, this illusion of some safety to be found, the heavy-footed hoped to silence us. For all of us, this instant and this triumph, we were never meant to survive. So when the sun rises, we are afraid it might not remain. When the sun sets, we are afraid it might not rise in the morning. When our stomachs are full, we are afraid of indigestion. When our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may never eat again. When we are loved, we are afraid love will vanish. When we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So, it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. A little... Okay, there we go. Um, so, uh, Lord, oh, oh, just a, a word or two. She's written a lot about um, silence and speech. In fact, um, <laughs> she may be the only poet I know of who had a bumper sticker made out of one of her remarks about speech and silence. Your silence has, my silence has not protected me. Your silence will not protect you. I don't know if any of you ever saw that bumper sticker during the 70s, but um, for a while I had it on a car I drove in California. <laughs> Your silence will not protect you. Um, so she's asking people to speak out. And she is reminding people that there were groups of women, and she's speaking here, I think, specifically, but not exclusively for women, um, who have particularly been silenced. And, you know, when she, when she has lines like, um, uh, for, the, for those of us who cannot indulge the passing dreams of choice, um, or who love in doorways coming and going in the hours between dawns. Uh, and then I think broadens it out to include practically everyone. Um, but any, um, Marianne, any comments or questions about this in chat so far or about either of these poems? Um, um, there's, there's one, um, I'll quote it directly. We could, we could be all women, but maybe more women of color, like the silence that was first used during the HIV crisis. Ah, uh, yes. Um, that's a great, uh, it's a great comment. And Lord, 
does write, as we'll see if we're going to look at one more of her poems, she writes a lot about race, um, about intersectionality, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little while. But she was an incredibly important spokesperson for um, African-American women, for lesbian women. She, she often began her talks by saying, you know, hi, I'm Audre Lorde. I'm a... I'm a black lesbian socialist feminist mother. <laughs> and um, she claimed all of those identities, but there's no doubt but that in, in among in the I, there's a black women's movement, a black women's poetry movement. As I was looking for um, poems to include in this talk, I realized how many black women, how many um, lesbians, I mean, th th there's such a predominance of voices that had been previously marginalized in this literature. So thanks for that comment. Um, any others? That, uh, One participant thought immediately of slavery, which I think you just kind of addressed. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so many poems by Black women that refer to the Middle Passage and to slavery. That image is just absolutely pervasive and, and powerful. So, but, but I, I just, I, I think she's also... I mean, she begins by talking about more in this poem, more marginalized people, people who love in doorways coming and going in the hours before dawn, I think is a reference to people who are either prostitutes or perhaps um, sexual outlaws. Uh, in that era who couldn't love in the open. We have to remember that certain kinds of sexuality were criminalized then. And we'll talk more about that um, in a, a little bit in, in just a moment. Um, and then, the, but, but then this whole paragraph about fear uh, branches out to the fears that maybe all of us have um, that, you know, um, when we're alone, we're afraid love will never return. Um, when we're when we love, we're afraid it won't be it, that, that it will leave us. But also poverty, about which she speaks many times. When our stomachs are empty, we're afraid we may never meet again. So it both manages to create this community of the marginalized and to and to reach out to a broader audience. And I think that's one of Lord's particular geniuses in this in this litany. Um, all right, so uh, the next poem is a little bit lighter, and we are going to move on to a different theme. Um, we're going to talk now about a little bit about women's poetry of embodiment. And um, it really would be hard to, to exaggerate how many poems of this era deal in various ways with women's bodies. Uh, I would say that there is practically no um, bodily part or bodily process that women's poetry um, didn't address. And sometimes these, um, these experiences and, and bodily parts are addressed praise and affection in celebration, sometimes um, with more ruefulness um, or sadness. Uh, but I did, I made a list of the, of the poems that I, of the, of the different kinds of topics that the poems in my anthologies address. These are, this is just some of them. So lovemaking, both heterosexual and not. Um, celebration of my uterus, Poems in which my legs are accepted. That's a favorite of mine. Vaginas of women, tampons, ode to the hymen. <laughs> That's a selection. There are a lot more. Um, but I think it's important to say also that writing about embodiment made it possible to write about human relationships in a different way. Um, not just lovemaking, but there's some incredibly beautiful poems. I, I couldn't include them here, but I can tell you where to go if you're interested, about um, parent-child relationships, about mother-child relationships that are, that are sensual and, and elegant. We're going to hear one of them that's sadder. Um, but 
they also dealt with the more painful experiences of women's bodies. So here's one that's in celebration. This is Lucille Clifton, who was the poet laureate of the state of Maryland from 1974 to 1985. Love my hair, it's white, I think it's wonderful. And you're supposed to be about 125. And I was born wearing more than that. So I like to celebrate the wonderfulness that I am. And this universal poem is called Homage to My Hips. These hips are big hips. They need space to move around in. They don't fit into little petty places. <laughs> These hips are free hips. They don't like to be held back. These hips have never been enslaved. They go where they want to go. They do what they want to do. These hips are mighty hips. These hips are magic hips. I have known them to put a spell on a man and to spin him like a top. <laughs> So um, that's, that's Clifton at her humorous best. Um, if you've never read her stuff, I really recommend it. It's not all funny by any means, but it's really fun to listen to most of the time. However, I will say the next poem that we're going to look at, which is also another short poem of hers, um, deals with another kind of topic. And um, I'll read... Uh, this poem. Um, um, this is from a series of poems called Shapeshifter Poems. And in the Shapeshifter Poems, the f there's a figure that hovers over them, which is a male figure who during the day is a father who turns into something else at night. Who is there to protect her from the hands of the Father? Not the windows which see and say nothing. Not the moon, that awful eye. Not the woman she will become with her scarred tongue. Who, 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 the owl laments into the evening. Who will protect her? this pretty little girl. So um, that's one of the many poems that women write that do deal with these topics of incest, of rape, of domestic abuse. And I, in my, I, I would even argue that the poetry becomes a really important place to theorize domestic abuse um, because we have to remember as I don't know if, if you know but the term domestic violence did not come into being until 1973 with the women's movement mm -hmm. and it's not that the poets themselves use that term but they were part of of, the, of a movement of um, speaking out about the things that happened even in the home that led to the creation of new laws and also led to the possibility for people to name themselves as survivors and to create a, a movement around it. So again, I, I think poetry was a really important site for, for expressing what could not, what had not been expressed and which now, which now had to be expressed. Um, so the next poem that I'm going to look at um, is uh, by Minnie Bruce Pratt, and it's a longish poem, and I'm going to ask Carter to put it into chat. 
uh, and I'm going to be reading it and, and asking you to bear with me because we're going to talk about it a little bit afterwards. I think it, it summarizes a lot of these themes. So um, you'll be able to kind of, I think, raise your hand after Marianne will look for your hands uh, and as well as put things into chat. So let's see how this goes. So Carter, is it in chat yet or? Okay, so yeah, can people see it? I, I my chat isn't open, but yes. yeah, okay, great. Um, so this is poem for my sons. It's from 1990. Uh, a little bit of background. The, the poem is from a book called Crime Against Nature. Um, and Crime Against Nature won the Lamont Prize for Poetry. It's a really big deal. It's a wonderful collection of poems. And they deal with what happened to Minnie Bruce Pratt when she, she came out as a, she was, um, she, by the way, she, Minnie Bruce taught with me at the University of Maryland and helped me do my first course on um, a, a course called Women's Art and Culture. Um, she was wonderful to work with. But she grew up in North Carolina, married in North Carolina, and then le left her husband and became involved with a woman. And her husband sued for custody of their young sons and won. And she spent years after that fighting for custody and talking about the issue of, crim of criminalizing her sexuality um, and losing her children as a result. She's not the only person that this happens to. Um, so this is her poem to her sons. It's addressed to her sons, but written later than these events. <clears throat> when you were born, all the poets I knew were men, dads eloquent on their sleeping babes and the future, Coleridge at midnight, Yeats's prayer that his daughter lack opinions, his son be high and mighty, think and act. You've read the new father's loud eloquence, fiery sparks written in a silent house, breathing with the mother's exhausted sleep. When you were born, my first, what I thought was milk. My breasts were sore, engorged, but not enough when you woke. With you, my youngest, I did not think. My head unraised for three days, mind dead from waist down with anesthetic labor, saddle block, no walking either. Your father was then the poet I'd ceased to be when I got married. It's taken me years to write this to you. I had to make a future, willful, voluble, lascivious, a thinker, a long walker, unstruck transgressor, furious, shouting, voluptuous, a lover, a smeller of blood, milk, a woman mean as she can be some nights, existence I could pray to, capable of poetry. Now here we are, you are men, and I am not the woman who rocked you in the sweet week of penicillin, sour milk, the girl who could not imagine herself or a future more than a warm walled room had no words but the pap of the expected. And so those nights could not wish for you. But now I have spoken myself. I can ask for you that you'll know evil when you smell it, that you'll know good and do it, and see how both run loose through your lives, that then you'll remember you come from dirt and history, that you'll choose memory, not anesthesia, that you'll have work you love, hindering no one, a path crossing at boundary markers where you question power, that your loves will match you thought for thought on the long heat of blood and fact of bone. I can only pray that you'll never ask for the weather, earth, angels, or women, or other lives to obey you, that you'll remember me, 
who crossed, recrossed you as a woman making slowly toward an unknown place where you could be with me like a woman on foot in a long stepping out. So this is a poem that combines the language of the body, um, the desire to speak out at a level that's deeply personal, but also quite literally political. I mean, often political in those years meant just relations of power, but here she's talking about laws that took her children away. So I'm very literally political. Um, and also poems that we often hear in those years of, of hope, of longing, of aspiration. So comments about this poem. Um, I think um, we're running a little later than I thought we would. This talk is like an accordion. It can stretch or it can be, <laughs> it can be more compressed. Um, but we can take a few minutes um, to talk about the poem. So comments, anyone? Um, and Marianne, maybe you could call on people or read what's in chat. I don't see any comments. I think we're probably all overwhelmed. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was lovely. Um, yeah. Oh, here, here's one. Did she get her children back? She did not get her children back as young children. Um, she, it, was, it was a losing fight, but she worked really hard to maintain relations with them. She was given visiting rights, and um, she would, the crossing and recrossing is her travels to where they were because she had to make a long drive through the hills to get there, um, through the hills of North Carolina, um, to get to where her children were. And um, she grew up on very good terms with her sons because she was able to visit with them. But no, she never, she did not um, get legal custody back um, until very late, I think very late. Yeah. Other, other questions? Comments. What year was this, Deborah? Uh, the poem came out in, in 1990, but um, the but the experiences were well. She was born in 46, and uh, the experiences were in the late 50s, early 60s. Yeah. Um, you know, when she was a, a young mother, and she is not alone in having had this experience by any means. So. Yeah. You know, it was such an amazing time. I'm not a mother, so I can't sympathize with that. But I look back to when we bought our first house in 1969. Yeah. Um, my income could not be considered because I was of childbearing age. Um, yeah. And you think of the discrimination. So to me, recent, it wasn't recent. But, you know, I mean, we really have come a long way despite having a long way to go. Um, it yeah. It's amazing. You're Right, absolutely right. And historically, it was recent. I couldn't get a credit card in my own name. Oh. I got divorced in my late 20s. Yeah. Um, we do have another question. What do you think she refers to using the phrases, like a woman on foot in a long stepping out? Um, well, she talks about herself as a walker. And, you know, there was a period when women didn't do a lot of walking on their own. Um, it wasn't considered safe and it wasn't considered ladylike. Uh, and um, she, so one of the, so she makes references to walking, but I think also it has to do with that unknown place. And there are a lot of images that, that do, um, have women heading out um, on a quest of some kind with a kind of undefined aspirational goal. Um, and it's, it's left vague because, well, Adrian Rich um, at the end of uh, one of her poems um, from a survivor, she, she says, uh, talks about living now, um, living her life not as a leap, but as a succession of brief, amazing moments, 
each one making possible the next. And it's, I think that's like the long, they're in dialogue, of course, Rich and Pratt. And I think there that that moment of those those moments each one making possible the next you don't know where it's leading to so it's that long stepping out towards an unknown future because these writers really thought of themselves and i i think people in the women's movement i include myself thought of ourselves as really making a new world of really you know creating something new and um, <laughs> you know, what, to talking about whether or not we succeeded is a long conversation that we won't try to have right now, but maybe, you know, if there's time at the end, we can get back there. Any other questions or comments here? Before? Another comment. Um, it, it so powerful, almost like an ethical will to her sons, telling them of what maleness was when they were babies, yes. later of how they ought to treat women and others, and on and on. So very powerful. Absolutely. I, I, that is such a beautiful way of putting it. Thank you. And the beginning where she talks about uh, Coleridge and Yeats. Yeats, William Butler Yeats is a famous, well-known poet who writes beautifully, by the way. I, I, I mean, I, I have a painful love for Yeats's poetry, but he's got a poem called Poem for My Daughter, where he literally hopes that she won't have a loud voice, um, that she won't try to engage in, in contemporary politics and art. Ireland, um, that she'll let her, her, the men she loves, the man she loves do all that for her while she monitors the domestic hearth. And it is just an infuriating poem. <laughs> well, and here's an interesting question. Um, I wonder if men also lost custody of their children for the same reasons. When they were gay, you mean, or if they, if they became... I presume. You know, I... I'm afraid to answer that. I want to say I think that may well have happened. Um, I know that men who became transgendered lost custody of their children uh, because I, I, I remember a couple, I, I know a couple of those cases. I, I don't know if men coming out as gay and leaving their marriage for another man then lost, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised, but I'm just not sure. So, yeah. That's a really good question. Have to look into that. Okay, so we should we should move on. But thanks for your great questions and comments. Um, so I want to just say at this point that um, Adrian Rich. I, I think many of you know about her, and she is certainly one of the most important poets of of the women's movement. Um, both Rich and Lord suffered in their later lives from terrible diseases. Lord from cancer, Rich from rheumatoid arthritis, and they both wrote about those diseases. And eventually, of course, they both died from them. But to, to, to write about cancer, to write about disability, um, which wasn't a term that they used in their poetry, I mean, disability, but this does become a place where it becomes okay to talk about a disabled female body. Um, I'm going to read this. This is an excerpt from a series of long poems, and it's about pain. And I had to look up detritus and see how it was pronounced and what it meant. Um, and it, it means um, sort of erosion and decomposition um, of, of the body and um, of other living things, basically. Um, organic waste is what it means. <clears throat> you for whom I write this in the night hours, when the wrecked cartilage sifts round the mystical jointure of the bones. Um, in her later pictures, you can see the, the, deformed, the deformity of her hands. When the insect of detritus crawls from shoulder to elbow to wrist bone, remember the body's pain and the pain on the streets are not the same, but you can learn from the edges that blur. Oh, you who love clear edges more than anything, watch the edges that blur. Um, 
I want to suggest that where, when she's talking here about the pain of the body and the pain on the streets, the body's pain, the pain on the streets, she's wrestling again with that issue of the relationship between the personal and the political. How does the fact that she's writing a poem about her own suffering from rheumatoid arthritis relate to the other things she writes about, which include war, poverty, racism, um, you know, the whole litany of, thing, of, of systemic cruelty that happens to um, marginated groups of people. And she, Rich has written a lot about that. And, and there's a kind of struggle here to figure out how to talk about it, you know, how to write about it, this, the, this relationship between the political and personal. So it's not always an easy equation, the political and the personal. Um, so I'm, but I'm, I'm going to go on to um, uh, another group of poems um, because we are going to be, we are a bit running out of time. Um, and this last group of poems has to do with identity, with difference, with reaching across borders. So this is another poem by Audre Lorde. Let me ask here, while I'm saying a little about it, if there's somebody who would like to read this, in case you're getting tired of hearing my voice, because um, there's one more poem uh, maybe two more that I'll be reading. If somebody would like to read this, please raise your hand and let um, Marianne know. But I'll, a little bit of, of background to, to this. I, Lord, I think, in this poem um, is actually kind of theorizing intersectionality. Um, I mean, she's, there's, this is a poem about anger of black women towards white women, and there are a lot of poems that, that do this. Um, but it's also a place where she claims more than one identity. Now, I don't know how many of you have ter heard that term intersectionality. It's widely used in women's studies, but to my astonishment, in five or six years ago, or maybe four or five years ago, when I went to a pussy march demonstration, there were young women carrying signs saying feminism is intersectional. Um, it was like the surprise, the bumper stickers, you know, that um, your silence will not protect you. Um, it means that people have multiple identities, race, gender, sexuality, class, parental status, work, political affiliation. And Lord is, is, is saying, Lord is of all writers, I think one of the people who most refuses to be identified by a singular identity. So she's there for a women's march, and this is what happens. Um, anybody want to read this? I don't see any volunteers, Deborah. No, You're doing such a good job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I will go ahead and do this. But um, there are a lot of people reading. By the way, there are at least 10 versions of this on YouTube of people reading it. And um, I liked some of them, but it wasn't like hearing Audre Lorde. <clears throat> so I was sorry that I couldn't find a reading by her. There are so many roots to the tree of anger that sometimes the branches shatter before they bear. Sitting in Needix, the women rally before they march, discussing the problematic girls they hire to make them free. An almost white counterman passes a waiting brother to serve them first, and the ladies neither notice nor reject the slighter pleasures of their slavery. But I, who am bound by my mirror as well as my bed, see causes in color as well as sex. Um, you, so you get what happens there. Um, that, they, that the women are sitting in this coffee shop. Needix is a famous hot dog shop in New York. They're getting ready for this march. They order coffee. Um, 
the counter man, who's almost white, not quite, um, passes them to serve an African-American man. I, I mean, passes an African-American man to serve them first. And they don't notice that there's somebody who's been waiting longer than they have. Um, they're discussing the issues with their maids who have freed them up to go on this march. Um, but I, who am bound by my mirror, and here's this eye again, where she sees her black face, as well as my bed, and again, this reference to her lesbian sexuality, see causes in color, as well as sex, that is, you know, both, both race and gender, that, that theorizing again at the, at the level of the poem um, about the intersections and complexities of our identity. Um, Okay, uh, so um, I, are there any other comments about this poem? I think we may have time for one or two. I don't see any. Okay. Well, does it matter if these women who are rallying are white or black? Do we, do we assume? Good question. Anybody else want to respond to that? No? Okay. Well, I will. I, okay. I, yeah, I, I think they're white. And I just because of the context, um, you know, they're there for a women's rally. Um, and um, they are being served before a black man. So which makes me think that they, they, you know, makes me think they are white, because they benefit she says they, the, the, the slighter, I love this line, the slighter pleasures of their slavery. So their whiteness gets them a little something, but there's still women in, you know, uh, with all the issues that are women's issues. Um, and then, of course, she talks about all, then she goes into this intersectionality thing. There's race, there's sexuality, uh, there's, there's sex or gender. Yeah, I think they're white. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. With that, I, I, I think it. Yeah, I agree. It's interesting that she talks about the slighter pleasures of their slavery. Um, this is a 1973 poem, and a couple of years there was in the very early late 60s, early 70s. There was a lot of writing that compared women's experiences in marriage to slavery. That just wasn't right. <laughs> I mean, it was a rhetorical acknowledgement and an acknowledgement that, that, that women's rights in marriage were extremely limited. But by the mid-70s, I don't think people were making that equation anymore. So there's an evolution in thinking in a lot of these poems. And I, I, some of these evolutions are really interesting. I, 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 I saw one, for example, about domestic violence that I wanted that I would have liked to include by Sharon Olds, where she refers to the survivors of domestic violence as um, uh, uh, to, to, to people who, to herself as a survivor. And, year, and then you read a much later version of that poem that was published in a later collected um, edition of her works. And she's changed all the syntax, so she doesn't claim the identity of a survivor anymore because she also refers to her the Holocaust to say what kind of survivor she'd been referring to. And by then she knows that it's not okay to equate <laughs> the survivors from the Holocaust to the survivors of domestic violence. Similar, but not the same. And there's some wonderful poems about similar, but not the same. We're, we're actually going to end um, with one of them. Um, Before you do, Deborah, um, Helena has her hand up, and it's probably related to this poem. Okay, great. Uh, Helena, on me. Yes, yes. I, I really like this poem. And what I like about it is that it sort of presages, it, it, it sort of predicts our understanding of white supremacy. She's basically pointing out that these women think they're li being liberated and demonstrating as white women, but they don't realize that there is still a form of slavery in that they don't see their, their maids as their equals. Yep. 
And she, it, not just predicting issues around white supremacy. Remember, this is after the civil rights movement. I mean, this is 1983. Yes. So, but it definitely comes out of a critique of white supremacy that is incredibly important in the women's movement. I mean, it's, 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 an, it's a movement that tries very hard to be inclusive. And there's a way, you know, there's a way that... At the beginning of the women's movement, you get songs like Helen Reddy's, you know, I am woman, I am strong. But 10 years later, you don't get people saying, I am woman, right? Because there are really many women's movements and many different groups of women. And we begin to recognize that, not, uh, that, that one woman cannot speak for all groups of women. And it becomes a problem too, because you still want to pass laws that, you know, that, that, that help women <laughs> as a group and, um, or, or that help African-American people as a group, but they're also divided in terms of, you know, their countries of origin and men versus women. How do you deal with that? That is one of the things that critical race theory tries to deal with, for example, around issues of race. Um, but, and and <laughs> it is so strange the way people have picked that as a target, the way Republicans have picked that as a target. But but here in this poetry, you can see that Lord is trying to think about these uh, these differences that uh, the, the differences in the degree and the type of oppression. Um, and, and we remember when we look at the area of law as well as the area of speech and culture and, and marital relations, that all these differences matter. Um, so um, we are going to um, go on now to another poem. Um, let me see. I am... I'm a little lost. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, this is Deborah. Yeah. Um, Jill Schindelman has a, uh, a question, a point in the chat, which uh, of the two additional lines that are in the PDF for the poem. Okay. Um, Jill. Jill, do you need you need to unmute? Yes, I put them in the chat. I'm not sure what happened. I think there are two more lines at the end of the poem that somehow didn't make it into the, the slide that uh, Debbie showed. Oh. It, it ends with, and sit here wondering which me will oh survive all these liberations. Oh, you're absolutely right. Oh, my goodness. And I didn't even, you're absolutely right. Well, I do not know. My apologies. I I don't know what happened there. You're, and that is really important. Those yes. lines. Are, hold on a second. No. Ah, can you see it now? Yes. Yes. And oh, you're. I, I can't believe I didn't notice that. And sit here wondering which me. Thank you so much. Will survive all these liberations. The irony there. You know, the, the irony, the, the somewhat bitter humor. Thank you so much. Absolutely right and very important. Thanks. Okay. Um, now, here is Gloria Amseldua. And uh, again, um, this is a poem about multiple identities and the quest for identity. And um, I, about... Anzal Dua, she's another really influential poet. Um, and this quote, I will have my voice, Indian, Spanish, white. I will have my serpent's tongue, my woman's voice, my sexual voice, my poet's voice. I will overcome the tradition of silence. Again, about speaking out, but also uh, about claiming a kind of linguistic multiplicity of identity because she comes from a Tex-Mex borderlands background, uh, as we'll see in the poem. And um, she and and she claims of various kinds of borderland identities. Uh, this sort of goes with Rich's intersectionality in a way. Um, and and the poem
poem is very germane because it's also about literal borderlands, which are still, again, pretty germane in today's politics. Um, to live in the borderlands means you are neither Hispana, India, Negra, Española, ni Gabacha, eres mestiza, mulata, half-breed. I'll come back and translate. <laughs> Caught in the crossfire between camps while carrying all five races on your back, not knowing which side to turn to, run from. Cuando vives en la fr frontera, people walk through you, the wind steals your voice, you're a bora, buoy, scapegoat, forerunner of a new race, half and half, both woman and man, neither a new gender. To survive the borderlands, you must live sin fronteras be a crossroads. This is a very long poem and we're not going to have time to read all of it, but I, I wanted you to hear the way she incorporates the Spanish into a poem that's predominantly for two kinds of audiences, a, a, a local, you know, a community of Hispanic people, Spanish speakers, and a larger community of feminists who are and, and others who, who love poetry, who are going to go to the trouble of looking up these words. So you are neither Hispana, India, Negra, that's pretty clear, Española, um, Spanish versus Hispanic, meaning a Mexican-American or um, Spanish from, uh, 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 with an American hyphenated identity. Um, gabacha is a pejorative term for white folks. And mestiza, of course, used to be a condescending term, a not so positive term for a mixed race person. In Ansel Dewa's writing, she talks about la nueva mestiza, someone who literally lives in multiple borderlands, psychological borderlands, linguistic borderlands, as you can see, gender borderlands, because Ansel Dewa had a kind of trans identity. Um, and um, she writes here, uh, you know, um, about uh, a, a forerunner of a new race, half and half, but woman and man, neither a new gender. She had a, a, a gender fluid identity that she claims in this poem. Um, Bura is, an, uh, is a female burrow, booty, a scapegoat. And this, you know, these final lines, to survive in the borderlands, you must live sin fronteras, be a crossroads. You know, again, the, the person who exemplifies in their own being, their own daily life, their own linguistic and psychic choices, the borderlands. But I think it's really important to remember that the borderlands in this poem and elsewhere are also very literally geographic. Um, and um, in, in the other verses of the poem, she, she talks about the literal Tex-Mex borderlands and the struggles that are going on there. Then it's 1987, you know, many years later, and we have not yet uh, alleviated those issues. So, so many of the poems that women wrote then, I think, are still just so relevant today. <laughs> um, this poem, in this poem by Adrian Rich, um, I don't know why I'm, let's see, here we go. There, okay. Um, in this poem by Adrian Rich, she is rejecting the early emphasis in her poems of the 70s on the purely personal. In my view, the poems were never purely personal, as you've probably seen today, um, struggling, you know, struggling with that. Um, and I, I'm going to actually, I, I, I think instead of yeah, I want you to hear her voice, so I'm going to quickly play the whole thing. But I love that phrase, the great dark birds of history, um, which she sees as making it necessary to think of the, of the human being 
in historical context, in the historical moment. We are so much seeing that at this historical moment. Um, so I'm going to play this. We're not going to talk about this poem, but then we'll move on to the final poem. In those years, in those years, people will say, we lost track of the meaning of we, of you. We found ourselves reduced to I, and the whole thing became silly, ironic, terrible. We were trying to live a personal life. And yes, that was the only life we could bear witness to. But the great dark bird's history screamed and plunged into our personal weather. They were headed somewhere else, but their beaks and pinions drove along the shore through the rags of fog where we stood saying. Oh, sorry, saying I, I clicked a moment too soon. <laughs> So um, this last poem is a poem that very much reflects the great dark birds of history. Um, this is a poem that we'll need to have in chat. Um, and this is a poem by Irena Kletfish, who's the best poem you never heard, the po who's the best poet you never heard of. Um, Klepfish writes in both Yiddish and English, uh, and her poetry is very close to my heart. Um, this is a poem from East Jerusalem, um, Beit Shalom, House of Peace, written in 1987. And um, she writes this poem um, she, she goes to Jerusalem with a group of women writers, of uh, Jewish women writers, actually, who go to dialogue with Palestinian women um, in the same way that, uh, Northern, uh, that British women, Northern Irish women dialogued with uh, women from Ireland um, and, and were the helpers in the making of peace. Um, alas, it has not yet been true in the, in the Middle East. Um, but these writers go and they have this dialogue uh, across boundaries and reach this, these poems of reaching out to women who are not only the other, but whose legacies and traumatic histories have been caused by one another um, are, are heartbreaking. Um, and beautiful. And so this is the one I'd like to close with. And there's imagery that I think if you've been watching your television lately, you will find very, very all too familiar. Um, I, this is, again, this isn't a complete um, poem. This is an excerpt. Uh, and I think we'll have a little time um, to talk about it at the, um, at the end. So this is it. Whether we like it or not, we must sit here. What we feel does not matter. And here she's addressing this, the poem is dedicated to this, to one of the women in particular. Um, and she's writing to, to her Palestinian counterparts. We are the heirs. Our legacy is in the air we breathe, the ground we stand on. You say to us, you must understand how it is for me. You are writers, write about it. You mean our voices carry, yours alone does not. All of us part, you move off in a separate direction. The rest of us return to the other Jerusalem. It is night, I still hear your voice. It is in the air now with everything else except sharper, clearer, I think of your relatives, your uncles and aunts. I see the familiar battered suitcases, cartons with strings, stuffed pillowcases, children 
sit, man, I'm going to have a hard time getting through this. Um, children sitting on people's shoulders, children running to keep up. Always there is migration on this restless planet. Everywhere there is displacement. Someone, somewhere, someone is always telling someone else to move on, to go elsewhere. Night, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Hebron, Ramallah, Nablus, Katana. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, O Hebron, may I forget my own past, my pain, the depth of my sorrows. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, there's one more slide, but I'm not going to read it. it it's, an, it's a Muriel Rukeyser poem, um, and you'd be able to see it, I think, um, if any of you want to see it. It's called In the First Century of These Wars and uh, of the World Wars. And again, it's a poem that is so relevant to what we're experiencing now. Um, the images, the bits and pieces of news that we get about what's going on in Ukraine. And um, I don't know what to say about it, that, except that these poems are still hopes that we can do better. Um, and they, I think they, they give us hope, even, when, even, when, even in moments of despair. I, I got, I, one of the few poems I ever published was called I Need a Poem. And there are times when um, that's what I need um, to help uh, deal with what's happening in the world. Uh, any comments or questions? I, I think you can see in that last stanza, If I Forget Thee, O Jerusalem, um, that is a, a, it's a biblical passage. It's a, it's a reference to one of the Psalms, If I Forget Thee, O Jerusalem. Um, uh, may my left hand cleave to my right, uh, my, my, may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. And, and um, it's a rewriting of the psalm to include not only Jerusalem, but the cities where Palestinians live um, and cities that have been destroyed by the settlements. Uh, so um, it is a reaching across the borders that divide human beings um, in the most powerful way. So, okay, so uh, we have eight minutes left for general comments or discussion where we can stop and go pull out our handkerchiefs. <laughs> right. Um, the comments include thank yous, um, th how powerful and poignant uh, that was, relevant, obviously. Um, a wonderful talk. I'm grateful to have been a part of it. So, um, uh, I think we speak, they speak for us all. Um, okay. Very yeah. moving. Yeah, I should have put a, hop, a happier poem at the end, but it's hard to do right now. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, it, it is hard. And Adrian. yeah, I think, I think one of the reasons I love these poets is that they're not afraid to speak of what's difficult. Um, and to speak honestly and openly, uh, but but they are. I <laughs> I really do wish I'd put a happier one at the end. <laughs> well, uh, it didn't discourage anybody. Somebody wants to convince you to make a course of this for us. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Huh. Was that Loretta? It might have been Loretta. I refuse to be to comment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, well, well yeah. whoever it was, I'll add my voice to it. Um, I think it was fantastic, and I'd like to explore a lot more with you. Um, 
You do have a poet, a poa, uh, a group that meets on poetry, don't you, Deborah? I oh, almost forgot to say that. Yes, we do. We have a. It's a University Park Helping Hands University Park group, and it's a poetry group. And we read both poems that we love from other writers, and some people, some brave people, read their own poems. And some of and some of the poems that people read of their own are really, really good. Um, and sometimes we will workshop a poem a little bit, although not as much as some of us would like so um i yeah if anybody's interested in that group please get in touch with um, me or loretta or uh jerry hendershot in university oh. park we meet about every six weeks more or less okay um maybe linda can tell us more or about how to get in touch linda Verrill, if she's still here well loretta oh. says their next meeting is sunday april 3rd from 4 to 5 30 and that you can rsvp to loretta at ah. oh, excuse me loretta uh and then capitals h h u p at gmail.com uh no i think they would have to write to linda verrill at linda can you <laughs> um, that was well, from loretta though yeah oh, um oh uh, it's people generally don't yeah rsvp to loretta h-h-u-p at gmail.com okay great that's wonderful right. great okay that would be that would be great we have a we have a good time and there we go over, over each you know the sort of language and structure and so on of each poem in, in much more depth than you know we're able to do today so yeah so okay. thank you all. You've been a you know you've been a great audience, and I think I talked too long and too much. But thank you. Oh no, no, no! no. We can go on for another two hours. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. There's another comment saying, "Great presentation, Debbie. We too would love more." It's from Jill Moss Greenberg. Oh, hi, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the passion, Deborah. Yeah, that's great. Can you, well, take, we, can you take the screen sharing off there? Oh, yeah. Share the screen so that we can see each other? Yes. Yeah. Much better. Yes. Hi, Good. mate. You can put yourself in gallery view. Oh, everybody. Yeah. There's everybody. Very good. Nice. Really good group. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this was just extraordinary. It, it was, was great. So wonderful. And, you know, it really does make a difference when you hear the poems being read than when you read them yourself. Absolutely. It really was so different. I've not been a fan of poetry. I'm writing fiction. But, yeah. um, and it really makes a difference, especially when you hear the poets reading them. Yeah, right. it, it, all it, their it expression. Does. And, it, it does make a difference. And these poems in particular, I think, are made to be heard because they were read in poet, you know, as I said at the beginning, in, in women's bookstores, at academic conferences. In my own women's studies program, we never started a meeting for years. Um, and those of you who were at Maryland, especially when Evelyn Beck was chairing the department, we never started a meeting without a poem, ever. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that that was, and, but hearing them aloud is so is different from looking at them on the page. Right. And I, I was part of a group uh, for a while that um, a, sort of a spirituality group that insisted, the woman that ran it insisted that, um, that when you read it yourself, it connects to your, to your heart, to your soul. <laughs> So, you know, it's, uh, that's really true, I think, when you read the words, they connect. I, I believe that because honestly, coming back to these poems, which I haven't looked at in a little while, you know, four, three or four years maybe, I, they, they're so moving. I was looking at some of them. I really wanted to include a poem by Carolyn Fourche, but she was sort of outside of my time period. She writes about poetry of witness, which is also where the personal meets the political. And I was reading the poem out loud to myself, and I, I literally couldn't finish it. I, it was about, uh, you know, her encounter with a taxi driver who had been a displaced refugee from the bombing of Syria and mm. had found it here. And he promises her at the end of the poem that he will get her safely to where she wants to go. And man, I just... You know. <laughs> wow. 
Wow, wow. I know. They're, they really are. They really do something for us. I think almost at the neurological level. Right, right, yeah. right. Well, and also to have you put them into context for those of us who aren't familiar with them to really understand who the women who were, they were. Who were writing, um, all of that just, just helps so, so yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to, I may call this to a close unless there are some additional comments. I did totally forget to tell everybody that this session, as all of our sessions through this um, first six months of the year, are supported by the city of Hyattsville. So I have to, I have to give them credit for giving us a, a, a grant that allows us to continue these. Um, we are holding another one in uh, April, uh, which include, which is Tim Carmen, who is the uh, on April 23rd, who is one of the Washington Post food writers who's going to talk about how he um, selects food, how he thinks about how he thinks about food and what he writes about it, and he'll give us a tour of Route 1 places that he thinks that are great. Uh, and then in, in May, we have a, actually a hands-on art program with Raquel Keller, who's part of Artworks Now and some other places in Greenbelt, who will be doing an art program and um, you bring yourself and she'll tell you what to collect for that program and, and um, we can do some art together. So uh, again in June and July, August, September, we haven't chosen those topics yet, we will be planning them. But thank you everybody for coming and if there are any last comments, we'd love to hear them. Yes, thank you so much. Oh, and thank you, Deborah. Absolutely, this was wonderful, and um, hope to see, hope to join that April third meeting. It was just great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much.